This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is made possible by 420 friendly service providers in the Gondrepreneur Business Directory. If you need professional help with your business, from accounting to legal services to consulting, marketing, payment processing, or insurance, visit gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to find service providers who specialize in helping cannabis entrepreneurs like you. Visit the Gondrepreneur Business Directory today at gondrepreneur.com slash businesses. Hey there, I'm your host, T.G. Brandfault, and you are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of Gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Ezra Soiferman. He's a Canadian artist, photographer, documentarian, and cannabis advocate. He's a former artist in residence for Canadian cannabis company Tweed, whose work currently appears in their visitor center. Uh, his first film, Pressure Drop, released in 1993, told a fictional story of a grandfather who used cannabis for glaucoma and follows the Pressure Drop Club through their personal journey to treat themselves with medical cannabis. He's also directed Grass Fed, a documentary focusing on Canadian actor and comedian Mike Patterson in his quest to use a cannabis and hemp rich diet to overcome sciatica. Additionally, Ezra started the Hemp for the Homeless Project, which collects functional and nutritious hemp products from hemp companies to create hemp help kits for folks in need. Uh, welcome to the show, Ezra. This is the first time you've been on. This isn't the first time we've chatted. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much, TG. I'm, I'm super delighted to have you, as I said at the beginning. Uh, before we sort of get into you know that laundry list of stuff that you do and have done, um, why don't you tell us about your background and how you'd come to focus on cannabis and hemp? Well, back in 1993, I was living in New York City and going to NYU Film School. And a buddy of mine, uh, Mark Ostrich, and I, we, we discovered this newspaper article that was all about a woman who was growing cannabis for her son, for his medical conditions. This was in 93 before medical medical cannabis was a thing. Uh, it was certainly being used, but in a limited way across the States and across the world compared to today. And we, you know, kind of capitalized on this and turned it into a short film, which I'll tell you more about. But it, it also opened my eyes to hemp and the, uh, the versatility and the history and the awesomeness of that uh, sister plant to marijuana. And you know, there had been some exposure to cannabis back in the day at the end of high school and reading about it and, you know, seeing uh, High Times magazines and uh, magazine stores in Montreal where I'm based. So it kind of crept up on me. And then once me and Mark got set on, on the pressure drop journey, that's when everything opened up and we started researching it and kind of living the experience and seeing how, how this has changed our world. So... How did you find the story for that 1993 film when, when medical cannabis, as you said, was not really widely used and was far less mainstream in the United States? Well, there was the newspaper article in the New York Times, and we basically combined that with my grandfather's story. My late grandfather, uh, Benny Poffolis, he had glaucoma and never used medical cannabis for his eyes. It wasn't offered to him and it wasn't really much uh, talked about or known up in Canada at the time. I certainly didn't know about it. But then when we saw this article and these other articles about glaucoma, cannabis, we took my grandfather's story, mixed it in with uh, our imaginations and created something that was a bit of a fantasy on medical cannabis back then. And you have to understand, if we think back to 93 and the 80s and before that, almost all the medical, sorry, almost all the marijuana movies that were being made were either Cheech and Chong films, uh, mentions in comedy movies, uh, reefer madness movies. There was not 
a lot, if anything, going on in the medical marijuana filmmaking scene. And we said, you know, we're going to do this. It, it's our thesis movie. Um, and we, we ended up producing this 18-minute film that came out of left field, took our university by surprise. Then it got a Warner Brothers Pictures Award from the school and it went on to play 25 film festivals around the world. It opened up our careers. I think it's because we, we took this uh, at the time, obscure, uh, stigmatized topic and turn it into a comedy that could be accessible from different angles. So we found actors who were seniors who weren't using medical cannabis, but we told them about the script. They were willing to to take the leap and, and act in a film like this. And uh, they were actors who were from the, the old Yiddish theater scene back in New York City. Yeah, uh, we found them through the Second Avenue Deli by asking the the uh, maitre d at the restaurant if he knew of any good uh, classic senior Jewish actors, and he said, "Walk down the street to the Hebrew Actors Union." So we ventured down Second Avenue and hung a right onto I think Sixth uh, East Sixth Sixth Street and uh, went upstairs, and there was a whole dinner going on with all these uh, veteran like 70-something and 80-something Jewish actors. And amazingly, that place still existed at the time. And the, the first woman to approach us at the door, asking us why the heck we were there, these two pipsqueak uh, young filmmakers, uh, we said, do you act? And she says, I was in Avalon. You know, Betty Levinson, <laughs> I was in Avalon. And sure enough, she was in Avalon for about three seconds on screen. She she did a fantastic job for those three seconds. And she she used to be on uh, the Yiddish stage back in the day. And then she found the co-star. And we turned this into a really cool, fun movie. And people could still watch it now if they just Google Pressure Drop movie. It's at PressureDrop.com. So you said that it took, sort of took your school by surprise. What was the reaction at that time? Well, first of all, we were supposed to make like a, a three to five minute movie. Um, and we ended up making an 18 minute movie and showing the script to our teacher. And he said, look, you guys really seem to have it together. You've done your research. You're two people making a project together. Um, you know, co-directing can be tough, but uh, you and Mark, if you f you're comfortable, uh, I can bend the rules and and make it. See what see what comes of it. So we we weighed weighed the options and we said let's go for it. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity, and we have a story that we feel is special and needs to be told now. Um, and we we did so, and then we worked for months editing it with uh, classmates and put something together that we were ready to show. And right away, like I said, it, it got the Warner Brothers Award and then it moved on. We, we, we hustled. We, we sent it to the New Orleans Film Festival and out to London and to California, up to Canada. And uh, many of the film festivals accepted it and then spread the word to other film festivals. And it, it just like opened up our careers. Like who, who at the time was making medical marijuana movies basically nobody and we said look let's take this take this and see where it goes and it didn't it wasn't something where i felt like okay now i'm going to make marijuana movies for the rest of my career this is it i still have uh, a huge curiosity for so many things on our on our planet as uh, beautiful and troubled as it is there's so much to see and i'm i'm grateful and uh thrilled to know that i've discovered cannabis 25 years ago, but, and it stuck with me all this time, the passion and the, the, the fascination with it hasn't abated at all. 25 years, you have to understand that I'm still reading about this stuff every single day, but I found other things too. I love making movies about food, uh, different historical things. I have a medical interest, um, cool, random people, underdogs, you know, I, I'm just grateful that we we took pressure drop, we ran with it, and it, it opened things up. So, more recently, you've worked on Grass Fed. Um, mm -hmm. So, so how did you come across Mike Patterson? So, Mike Patterson um, comes from a, a long line of Canadian kind of goofball, oddball, big, lovable, friendly, accessible comedians. Uh, John Candy comes to mind, and. Mike, I had seen him performing here and there over the years. He lived in my neighborhood with his brother uh, for a little while. And then a friend was directing a short film that starred Mike. And I worked on that as a camera guy uh, back 
must have been about 15 years ago. So we met and talked and hung out during that shoot. And then um, this was about 2013 or so. Edibles were starting to catch on in California. Um, Colorado would soon have uh, legalized recreational uh, right around that time. And we, and I, I basically knew that edibles was going to be something that would ramp up rapidly and become a huge um, option for patients and for, for uh, consumers. And I wanted to make a a TV series about edibles and exploring that world. So I went to a production company in Montreal. It's a big Canadian production company and they do really uh, successful and creative stuff. I told them the idea. They love the idea of doing this kind of survey of the edibles world, but we were trying to focus it down. And we said, well, maybe if we find a host, the host can help us focus it. So I, I actually put forward Mike's name as a potential host. They liked the idea. Um, but we had a, a number of different names. And then coincidentally, a couple of days later, I bumped into Mike Patterson at a, a theater, the Seagull Center in Montreal, where I used to work. After a, a play I was seeing there, he was in the lobby. He had just finished performing in, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name, the uh, Always Be Closing, the, uh, uh, what's the heck's that thing? Anyhow, some some awesome play that I'm I'm spacing on, and he was uh, so. Some of your listeners will know. Always be closing. It's um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. He was starring in that, and Mike and I talked in the lobby, and I say, Mike, you know, I've got this edibles project, and uh, maybe it's something that would be up your alley. I, I was very kind of low key about it, and he said, Listen, I got a secret. Uh, I'm now taking edibles for my sciatica. Nobody knows this except my fiance because she makes me the edibles. And uh, basically she's the only one who knows this and it started to work. Um, I'm able to manage my pain from my sciatica, but I can't tell my agent because she's gonna not wanna send me out on jobs. And you know, uh, acting gigs are gonna be skeptical of a guy who has a, a known medical condition. So I've kept it low key, but I have horrible back pain and every night I'm lying on the floor, Ezra, and I'm, I can't deal with life, but the, the cannabis has started to help. So I said, okay, this is perfect. Let me get back to you and see if we can work together. So I went back to Muse, the production company. They said, this is amazing. Let's do it all about Mike and his journey. Forget about a TV series. Let's make a feature film. So we did that. And we made a, a feature movie that uh, went on to explore Mike's uh, journey as he changed his lifestyle, changed his eating habits, changed his medical regime, and became a legitimate, uh, legal medical cannabis patient in the Canadian system that had started back in 2000. Now it was 2014, and I was following Mike as he joined the system. And the film is wild because I follow Mike to California, to Colorado, as he learns about what edibles are and how they can help patients. And then uh, I don't want to give any anything away. And there's a lot to give away, but I don't want to. But basically, he turned his life around. And the change that we see happen in his, uh, in his health and his weight and his love life um, goes from zero to 60 very quickly in that movie. And grass fed is something I'm really proud of. And it, it ended up on television across Canada on the CBC Documentary Channel in Australia, and now it's on iTunes and Google Play, and it's had a, it's had a beautiful run. And I, I loved working with Mike. He's he's a a, a riot, the guy. So in in the United States, um, you know, we recently the Super Bowl just happened, and they actually blocked a uh, medical cannabis commercial. You know, meanwhile they're inundating us with with booze ads. Um, you know, we, we get a little bit of the, the culture with Vice um, and, you know, CNN with Gupta has, has done some stuff on medical cannabis. However, um, it's, it's very unlikely that, that you're going to see sort of feature films um, well placed on any mainstream American channel. How grass fed end up on the, C, on the CBC documentary channel? What was that process like? Well, like I said, my producer was um, 
very talented in what they do. They, uh, you know, a producer of a movie basically takes the idea and they find the director, they find the actors, they find the money and they find the broadcasters. Uh, in my case, because it's a documentary, we didn't really have to find too many actors or any at all other than a comedian. Uh, they found um, the director in me because I approached them. So the, the last thing was finding someone who would show this movie and, and help to get it funded and produced. And um, they basically had a meeting with an executive at the documentary channel, and he loved the idea. And he said, this is, he basically recognized that edibles were coming. Uh, it, edibles were not yet legal in Canada for patients to purchase. Uh, they're still not legal for, you, you can't buy cannabis brownies or anything like that as a medical patient through the licensed producers in Canada still. However, you can, as a patient now, um, make your own edibles at home or uh, in some cases have someone make it for you. But we're still not quite there yet. However, this coming October, uh, Canada will have uh, edibles and extracts and other things legal in shops across the country for recreational and, you know, medical will will follow and patients can go and buy edibles then. So a lot has changed since I made the movie, uh, but still uh, many things sadly have not. But you know, you know, cannabis, it, it's an ever evolving thing and we never know what tomorrow brings or what October brings. So I'm really excited that grass fed was a little bit ahead of the curve. And now edibles have uh, continued to grow in popularity and, and it's helping people. I mean, you sort of have stayed ahead of this this cannabis curve throughout your career. When we met in Burlington, uh, Vermont last year, you were still an artist in residence with Tweed, um, which isn't something that a lot of people, if anyone else, can say. Um, could you explain what that actually means and what you did in that role? And how did you land such a cushy gig? Pardon the pun. Ha. <laughs> um Basically, one evening in Montreal, uh, I had this brainwave and I said to myself, you know, there's all these places that have artists in residence and I see them as an artist, as a filmmaker and a photographer. I, I read these postings in uh, newspapers or blogs, magazines, about people who were selected as the artist in residence at a museum, at a gallery. Um, sometimes at a company, and I was always fascinated by the the process of a corporation taking an artist under its wing and supporting him or her to create their art, and often doing so in a completely independent, hands hands off uh, way. Like what a dream for an artist to have that kind of support, and it reminded me. It reminds me of back in the day when the the uh, painters, the famous painters, were in some cases supported by wealthy families or uh, you know people with with means to do such a thing. They would support their art, and I, I simply believe more artists should have this access. So I had this idea. I've never seen an artist in residence featured at a marijuana company. The closest thing was back in. About 10 years ago, a hemp company in Canada had a hemp-fueled filmmaker. That, that was the only thing that I'd ever seen similar. And by coincidence, that hemp-fueled filmmaker was me. <laughs> so other than me, I hadn't seen anyone as an artist be supported by a cannabis company. So I said, okay, I'm going to make a proposal and pitch this to what at the time and still to this day was my favorite cannabis company, legal cannabis company, which was Tweed, which um, is owned by or part of the umbrella of Canopy Growth, which is a, a large, massive, uh, you know, cannabis company that has uh, reached around, around the world. They're in about 16 countries now. And I loved the Tweed brand from day one. When I read the first press release about Tweed in 20, uh, early 2014, I knew that they had a story. And I love stories as a filmmaker. And I could tell right away that these guys were thinking about more than just growing marijuana legally. They wanted to create a concept, a uh, lifestyle, and uh, uh, I guess a bit of a cultural 
uh, fingerprint on the cannabis scene up in Canada. And they first leased the old Hershey's chocolate factory, then they ended up buying it, and now they've expanded it. So it's a massive campus that they have in a small town in Ontario called Smith's Falls. And when I read that first press release back in 2014, I said, I want to somehow be in the uh, constellation of this company, um, in their world. And I wrote a letter to the CEO back then. I sent him an old Hershey's calendar that I found at a garage sale. And just like I like to do, even when I was a teenager, I, I just kind of approach these companies that I respect. And I, I try to uh, tell them that I, I dig what they're doing. So I did. And there was basically for several months, there was you know no further contact with the company other than me following what they were doing and how they were growing so quickly. And then one night, I had this idea to pitch them that they should be the world's first company to have an artist in residence and I should be the first artist in residence. So I didn't do it. I didn't send it off. I told my best friend, one of my best friends, Paul Flicker, I said, Paul, and, and Paul's one of the guys in this world that has the best gut feelings about everything. He's been right about virtually everything I've ever asked the guy in my life, except one thing. I said, you think Trump's going to win the election? <laughs> he, said, he said, not a chance, not a chance. <laughs> so other than that, Paul has had uh, impeccable um, foresight. And I said, Paul, what do you think of this idea? And he said, it's genius. There's nobody else who could do this. Tweet is perfect. You're perfect for it with your cannabis background and your filmmaking career and your photographs. Go for it. So I wrote up this one page a pitch and I got it ready to send to who uh, the guy who was then the president of the company who I had filmed with Mike Patterson a few months earlier when I called Tweed and said, can I film this guy who wants to see where his cannabis is being grown? I, f I followed Mike Patterson out there and we filmed with a guy named Mark Zakulin, who was then the head of uh, legal affairs at Tweed. Then he went on to become the president and I waited with that proposal for Artist in Residence. I waited until he saw Grass Fed, which was about to air on television. I wanted to make sure that, that the guy liked it and that I didn't like offend them or uh, portray them in some light that they thought wasn't right. Anyhow, long story short, two days later after the movie aired across Canada, Mark writes me this email. Wow, we loved your movie. Thank you so much for, for uh, showing this patient at our place. And if there's ever any way we could help you out in the future, you know, our door is open. Boom, I run, I run down to the, uh, to the local uh, career office and I send off this package with that proposal and with copies of my movies and with photographs. And I pitch them this concept of being the world's first uh, cannabis company to have an artist in residence and how it would help them get the word of their, their company out there, how it would support an artist, how it would help the arts and help cannabis and help me get the word out about hemp and, and medical cannabis, etc. Anyhow, they loved the idea. A few months later, we had a deal signed, and they basically uh, financed uh, new equipment and travel. I went to about 12 different cities over that period of one year. They gave me an honorarium, and they made me feel like part of the team and gave me essentially, literally carte blanche to do whatever photography I wanted. It wasn't even just cannabis photography. Um, not only did I have access to film in their facilities, but I also had access to their staff and to photograph the people who work there and to photograph the... Uh, I even went down to Jamaica with some of their staff and photographed them doing uh, kind of scouting down there. They've since opened up a facility in Jamaica. And I traveled to all these different cities doing stuff about cannabis, about cars, about uh, guitars, about you name it, I was out there making my art and supported by essentially the world's largest cannabis company. A dream come true. You take incredible photos. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to have one uh, hanging in my office, um, and it's unfortunate that this isn't a, a video podcast, so so we could you know display some of these things while you're talking, um, but people can find them. You know, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later where they can find your stuff. But what does it mean to you as an artist to now have your work featured in the visitor center of the world's largest cannabis firm? Uh, complete honor. Uh, they called me one day last uh, August or so and said, listen, we want to feature your art upstairs in the new visitor center in Smith's Falls, Ontario, which is like about 45 minutes out of Ottawa, a couple hours out of Toronto, a couple hours out of Montreal, kind of in the middle of nowhere, 
uh, in Ontario, a, a town of 10,000 people. They built this visitor center in the old Hershey's Chocolate Factory's visitor center, where, where Canadians, you have to understand, this visitor center was the biggest visitor center in all of Canada. People would go there and buy bags of broken chocolate. <laughs> and you could ask nearly any Canadian, especially nearly anyone from Ontario, and they will know that place and they will have gone there when they were a kid and now they say oh my god that's now a cannabis visitor center <laughs> and sure enough it is it's uh, basically part museum part coffee shop part uh, chocolate factory part grow operation um, there's a terpene center where you could go and smell all these different terpenes no there's staff taking you on tours and my work is now upstairs on the catwalk area when you walk around and look down at the chocolate edibles facility and then you look on the other side and you see the grow rooms um, my art leads you through it and helps to show additional things from the factory that the guests can't see through the windows. So there's pictures of the vaults and of the mother room and of the staff and of the R&D labs. And 25 large print frames of mine are up there. And it's been uh, like, I'm still kind of dreaming because I drive down to this place uh, once a month, twice a month to for meetings and to meet people and stuff and to see the new things going on there at the factory, but I also then go visit the visitor center and I walk in and it's like a little, uh, you know, cannabis museum with my stuff as the first artist featured there. So I'm totally blown away by it. And the feedback has been amazing. And people can see a lot of those pictures can be seen in the video that I made summing up my year as artist in residence. It's kind of like a greatest hits video called as in res. And, uh, that's on YouTube and it's on my site, etc. So it's been wild. Does, is, is, is there sort of this double layer of excitement for you being the, that it's hanging in this place that you visited when you were younger? Well, I didn't actually go there when I was younger. You're, you're the only Canadian but, that didn't go there when you were a child. I think there are like three <laughs> Quebecers who didn't go and I'm one of those and, and I think that's it. Um, so, but I've, I had heard as a kid, I always heard, yeah, we got this bag of chocolate for like $5. We got about like $50 worth of chocolate. It's all broken and half melted, but it's delicious. So in, in, in 2007, you launched your Hemp for the Homeless program. Uh, tell me about the conception of that program and how you've kept it going for more than a decade. Okay. So this filmmaker in Montreal who was an acquaintance of mine had a movie about a penny and he was going to bring this penny to life and he wanted to get a name for the penny who was going to star in the movie. It was this whole crazy thing. And he said, I'm doing a contest and anyone who could give me the name that, that sticks for the, for the penny in the movie uh, will win 500 bucks. So I'd never heard of anything like a, a contest like this. It, you know, like, first of all, for an independent filmmaker to be giving away $500, yeah. that alone is like, whoa, what's up here? Uh, someone uh, doesn't have a good business model. Um, anyhow, he did it and uh, he made this contest. And sure enough, um, I applied with uh, a couple of different names. And I love words. That's one of my passions, words and languages and coming up with names. And people know me for that. I've given people titles for their movies and I, I pick uh, interesting titles for my movies. Well, anyone who follows so said, you on social media can definitely attest to that. Yeah, I, thank you. I, I, try to, I try to add to my images with words and, and tricks of phrases that are uh, hopefully almost as clever or as, as interesting to read or look at as my pictures. So it, it's a, it's a, a, what do you call it? It's a, um, a multi-pronged approach I take. Anyhow, I went for it with a name. My name was chosen. The name that I, that I submitted was Juan, like J-U-A-N, Red Scent. Juan Red Scent. <laughs> and he picked it. I got 500 bucks. And I said to myself, you know, I don't want to buy myself $500 worth of stuff that this this poor filmmaker gave me. I, I, I accept it, and uh, but I want to put it to good use. So at the time, this was uh, tw uh, 2007, I had already been into hemp. And hemp was all, pretty much always my main focus, more than medical cannabis, more than recreational. I'm like all in on hemp and was from day one. The versatility of this thing, uh, the environmental aspects of hemp, the historical aspects, the cultural aspects, it, it covers all the bases and it's 
still so little known and little used that I see a massive, I see massive potential here. So I took that the five hundred dollars and I said I'm going to, have to use that to help homeless people in Montreal. And I called up all these hemp companies that I know in the states and Canada and got all this hemp stuff sent to me soaps from Dr. Bronner's and t-shirts from Hemp Town in British Columbia and uh, hemp lip balm from uh, Eco Lips down in the States, uh, on and on and on. And I made these hemp tote bags filled with hemp stuff that was functional and useful. And ultimately, I, I like to think that 50 people who didn't have all these uh, t-shirts and socks and and uh, functional things that it helped them out in some way. So look, fifty people benefited. It's not at all making much of a dent in the crisis in Montreal and Colorado and across the states and Canada that we have with homelessness. But it's my little part to help out and to uh, to help show that hemp can pitch in where anything else can. Hemp can join in if not take over. So I did that in 20, 2007, then I did it again at the NOCO Hemp uh, Expo in Colorado in 2017, and then again in 2018, and now I'm heading back this year, and we're going to do some more help kits for people in Colorado, and on and on it goes, you know. I want to grow it. I want it to be something that more hemp companies can get involved with. I want other people in other industries to see this and make them think about how they could help homelessness. And little by little, we chip away and uh, hopefully big strides. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about policy. Um, last year, Canada legalized cannabis for adult use. Um, can you tell me how it has or hasn't changed the life of the average Canadian citizen? Wow. So if you would have asked me before... October 2018, when it was legalized, how it would change things, I I would have thought then that it would have been more of an outward change, that we would have seen more people smoking on the streets or talking about it or having cannabis-themed parties. But to be totally honest, um, as great as it is that cannabis is now legal for recreational purposes and adult use purposes in Canada, um, when you walk around the streets, you don't see uh, any difference other than the four cannabis stores that are in the city of Montreal. So there's really not much outwardly. It's not like walking down Broadway in Colorado or down uh, Los Angeles, West Hollywood. You, you just don't see all those dispensaries. So it's pretty low key on the streets. Montreal has always been a place where people are, where you'll, you'll see people smoking on the streets, like uh, smoking a joint or a vape and you'll smell it. But it, I honestly have not seen a huge difference in that. Um, people have talked about it. The press has covered it. It's definitely something that made a big splash, but the sky has not fallen. We're not seeing people crashing their cars into fire hydrants. Uh, I'm not hearing people complaining. There have not been lineups at the hospitals. Um, I think it's kind of business as usual, but now they're selling cannabis uh, online and in stores. And I think it's a fantastic thing. <laughs> So, you know, you had mentioned earlier that that edibles still aren't available. Um, so what do you think about the, the law as it stands right now? You know, what needs to be addressed to make it better in your estimation? Wow. Well, it's a big set of laws. It's a big uh, bill that was put forward and there's all sorts of uh, new rules and revamp of old rules. It's pretty mammoth of how complex it is the, the, for driving and for the ages of who can consume. I think it's imperfect. I think some of it is problematic. Uh, the, in, in the province of Quebec, where I live, uh, you cannot grow four plants at home as you can in virtually every other province and territory of Canada. You can't grow any plants at home. Um, the, the province of Quebec wants to make it 21 and over instead of 18 and over. Some people are calling it like Canadians across Canada have called it prohibition 2.0. Interesting. Uh, 
Yeah, because there are so many uh, new rules around this stuff. You can't smoke it here, and you can't take it there, and you can't. Th- it, to some extent, you could call it that. Another another way of looking at it is: look, it is actually legal. There are many legal things that one can do with the with the plant now, and that's a big, big step. And we've opened the door now to making other uh, additions to the rules or modifications. Things I imagine will evolve. And as an old boss of mine said, when when things were chaotic, it, it's a work in progress, and we're going to get it right. So hopefully that's the direction Canada is taking. I think it's a huge step that we've taken. It is not perfect. That's my own personal opinion. Um, but it's we're we're getting there. So what's been your experience as a consumer living in a now legal market? Well, I've gone down to see the stores in Montreal. There are four stores across the city, uh, spread pretty widely so that it gives access to people across the town. And it's interesting, you know, when you go into a, a dispensary in Colorado, it's like you're like a kid in a, in a cannabis factory or a kid in a candy factory with all the selection. And it has not gone as smooth in Canada with the rollout. So you do see empty shelves and you see lineups out the door sometimes. The first like month, there were lineups uh, pretty much every morning before the stores opened. So much so that the, the, they couldn't keep the shelves stocked. And they ended up closing the Quebec stores, and they're still closed every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So it's a little ridiculous that um, we have these very handsome shops. I mean, there's all sorts of like wood shelving, and there's tons of um, staff, lots of customer service. They're wearing these beautiful aprons with the logo of the Quebec uh, SQDC, which is the the name of our... uh, Cannabis liquor, not liquor, the uh, Cannabis Commission. They've got these aprons on and they've got some nice products um, from some of the big and medium sized producers, even smaller ones. Uh, Customers seem to be happy. They're still, every time I walk by or walk into one of those places, there's still crowds in there. It's nice to see a business thriving, don't get me wrong. But it's been a little rock and roll the past uh, few months since it opened. It hasn't been perfect, but I know that people are going back and friends or, or um, strangers even that I've discussed the topic with have said that they've gone into check of these stores and they were pretty impressed. So we're getting there. Is, is on your end, now, you know, I, I, I only know what I know of you. Was there any, when those laws passed, were you able to sort of take a deep breath and be like, oh, I'm not a criminal anymore? Yeah, a really deep breath. Um, Absolutely. I I literally cried several times along the journey towards legalization because this is something that's so close to my heart and something I've been so fascinated with on a global scale, like not just Canada, but whenever there's a big stride in legalization or in in science, even medicine with with cannabis or some brilliant new product that comes out that's that's hemp or technology, it it warms my heart because it's like a child of mine, this plant. I just... I like to see it growing up and I missed the first 10,000 years of its history. But now that I jumped in as, you know, as a person on this planet to witness this, it always makes me, um, it makes me happy to see. What can I say? You know, legalization is a big step that Canada took. It was pretty ballsy and they were catching uh, flag from the UN and, the catching flack from everybody, pretty much, except for that percentage of the population who voted the Liberals and Justin Trudeau in to do this. And I was, uh, you know, following the elections closely. And when he won and he said, we're going to, you know, legalize cannabis in Canada, I, that was one time that I shed a tear. And then when the, uh, you know, when the laws started passing and going through the Senate and that whole journey was very... Uh, fraught with ups and downs. It was a roller coaster, and we really didn't know if it was actually going to happen. There were all sorts of times where it was questionable as whether this would pass. Sure enough, it did pass, and it has arrived, and the sky hasn't fallen. And people generally, from those I've talked to, seem to be 
uh, like thumbs up, we've done this. And now let's, you know, life goes on, but now we have the ability to consume without being a criminal. So, you, you know, you've, you've, uh, in our conversations, you know, you've said, you know, that you're obsessed with hemp. Um, you know, last year via the, the farm bill in the U S uh, hemp was finally legalized. Although, you know, it's, it's been, uh, there's been some restrictions. There's still been some police overzealous police officers who find truckloads of hemp in the U S and they, they arrest the driver and then they have to do this expensive testing and so on and so forth for was that U S legalization of hemp for you, uh, where does that fall on sort of the important scale for the significant scale for you? Big, big thing. Um, and the fact that it was Trump who signed it in uh, was, I, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but certainly strange. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who have things to say about him. And one thing that they will be able to say in, you know, down the road is that hemp became legal under Trump. So for, for what it's worth, it, that was super interesting to watch happen. And I was really excited about this farm bill as that was making its way through the system in the States. I knew it would be a big thing. Sure enough, it is a big thing. And it opens the doors to absolutely everything and anything on the hemp front, because as as we Canadians know, when you Americans go for it, you go for it. So hemp could turn into what I predicted years ago. Um, I've said for many years that I think hemp is going to be the next digital. Remember back in the 80s, like digital this and digital that. And, and then I said, when we hit uh, peak digital, it'll be when there's like the digital toaster. And sure enough, now my toaster has like digital circuits in it and it's, they sell toasters as digital. So I think digital, the whole like fascination, like with, oh, it's digital, it's digital. I think, I think, I suspect that hemp will be the next digital where people are going to say, yeah, I got a hemp t-shirt. I got my hemp in my car panels in my car and I got a hemp hat and I got this and I eat hemp for breakfast. And because it could touch all the things that digital can touch, which is basically anything. There's nothing on the planet as far as I've found, that's as versatile as hemp, other than maybe like water or air. But I mean, you can't build a table out of air and you can't make a t-shirt out of water itself. You can't eat water as nutrition, but yet you can make a table out of hemp. You can make, you could drink hemp. You can make a t-shirt out of it. You can, it's so versatile that the fact that we're overlooking it uh, you know, hemp is only in about four or five percent of fridges or pantries in Canada and the states. There's only five percent of people who have it at home. As that starts to ramp up, and people start to discover it and to have it in more of their mainstream foods and more of their fridges and pantries, which I think will be happening, can you imagine the the billions flowing into this and the interest and the product development and the the usefulness of this plant will finally be uh, appreciated, exploited, um, and understood. And uh, I, I think it will be for the better. I honestly think that the hemp, um, the hemp ramp up will be for the better for for everybody. It, it's kind of inevitable that a plant with such versatility shouldn't help make society a better place. You know, it does so many other things. Why shouldn't it do that? And then there, you look beyond that, it could help with climate change and it could help with uh, social issues and with jobs. And it, it, the list goes on and on and on. It's not just about the fact that you could make, you know, running shoes out of it or bags, but it could be good for society in general. So the farm bill, to answer your question, was massive. There are still things to iron out about it with, you know, CBD and is it a food? Is it a medicine? Is it the, But they're going to figure it out. And the money is there to be made and the people are out there to buy it. And as long as we educate the average person as to what hemp actually is, then we have a chance of growing more of it and selling more of it. Because if we don't tell people what hemp is, they're still going to be in the dark about it. They're still going to have a stigma around it and it won't quite work. But if we got the education and we've got the product development, we've got good luck, we've got good investment, limitless. Uh, potentially even bigger than digital. I mean, you're, you're, you're a heck of an advocate for hemp. Uh, when I met you in Burlington from head to toe, 
you were you were in hemp clothing. Um, so I've got to ask you, what's <clears throat> your prized hemp possession? <laughs> wow, uh, I have all sorts of hemp stuff in my in my place because I'm a collector of this too. I have boxes filled with samples of different hemp things that I will bring to a lecture or go through and organize and. Sometimes I'll show stuff online from the collection. My wardrobe is all hemp. Uh, so I've got jackets and hats, shoes and bags, hand creams and lotions. And so to pick my favorite one thing, uh, one thing that comes to mind that's top of mind, pardon the pun, is a yamulka, a kippah, a Jewish uh, you know, ceremonial head covering that I wore at my wedding that I had custom made. Custom made by this dude who was like a third generation hat maker. And I photographed the process and I, I got him the fabric from uh, Enviro Textiles in Colorado from uh, th those guys who are uh, geniuses of hemp fabric, Summer and Barbara Philippone. Um, I, I got him the fabric as this chocolate brown herringbone material and he made this beautiful uh, design for a kippa. And I wore it at my wedding and gave these hemp uh, kippahs out to all the people who were at the wedding too. And uh, to this day, the, the kippah is right on the uh, shelf near me. I'm feeling it now as I'm talking. Uh, it's, it's in perfect condition and I've worn it to many funerals and bar mitzvahs and weddings. Uh, it actually fared a lot better than my marriage did. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, hey, that's life, and I'm st I'm still on very good terms with with my ex wife, and I'm on very good terms with hemp to this day. So there's no problem. <laughs> um, that's hilarious, as. Uh, <laughs> so, what advice would you have for you know young artists who are considering sort of taking the path that you did and and, and sort of centering their art or, or trying to, you know, sort of break through with their art focused on this industry or this culture? Go for it. There is really uh, so much to be done to bring arts to cannabis and to bring cannabis to the arts. Um, art is, you know, tens of thousands of years old as well. As hemp, they both existed side by side, being something that for humankind was important and nourishing and appreciated. And when I, you know, dreamed up the artist in residence gig for myself with Tweed and Canopy Growth, I knew that I was onto something. I knew that I wasn't seeing the arts represented in the cannabis industry very much or at all almost. And I knew that I was the guy to 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 give it a little kick and, and see where I could take it. And I'm really, really pleased with how it's gone. And I've told artists along the way to go for it too, to reach out to cannabis companies, to hemp companies, and to offer to collaborate, to make partnerships, to do special events, to put art on their walls. Uh, there's so much that could be done to put more color into the cannabis world. Uh, right now, the focus with cannabis is its money, its products, its growth. But we have to remember um, one thing that ultimately, this plant brings so much fun to people, so much enjoyment, pleasure. It takes away pain. It inspires. And people can't lose sight of the fun aspect of cannabis, the colorful aspect. And I think the arts is a perfect vehicle to bring that over and have it be appreciated by those companies and by their cu their customers and their clients and make this, this cannabis space, this cannabis world, and the legal world on the streets a more artful place. So it's, it's up to the artists to do that and it's up to the cannabis companies to be open and inviting to these people who have the goods to share. Well, this has been a lot of fun, man. Um, you know, you, you, you say that, you know, the cannabis industry is fun. Uh, this is one of the more fun interviews I've had. I'm, I'm lucky to know you and, and to be able to have this opportunity and to have met you. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just across the board from one each other, from each other now. So I'm sure that, uh, 
we'll we'll see each other in person soon. But I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Where can people find out more about you, follow you, your social media, all that stuff? All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, TG. First, before I give out any uh, web addresses and stuff, it, it's really been a pleasure to talk to you. It's always, for me, it's always um, an honor to share my cannabis experience and to talk about hemp and all this stuff. At a party, people will ask me a question, and then thirty minutes later, we're still we're still talking, and it's me who's saying, "Listen, I don't want to, I don't want to talk your ear off." And you're like, "No, tell me more, tell me more." So. I never get tired of talking of this stuff. And when, when you and your podcast invited me on, um, I was really happy to, to, to hear that. And, uh, it's, it's great to be able to share with you and your, your listeners and to spread the word a little bit more because we all have to do our part to, to get the word out there. Uh, as far as seeing my stuff, it's on the web, uh, everywhere and anywhere, but the best place to learn more is to go to my own personal website, which is EzraSoiferman.com, E-Z-R-A-S-O-I-F-E-R-M-A-N, Soiferman. I, I would have been hemp for man, but that was taken. Um, anyhow, EzraSoiferman.com. And there you can look into my photographs, my movies. You could get to my, I have a YouTube Ezra Soiferman also. I'm big on Instagram at Ezra Soiferman. I'm on Facebook. People are welcome to join me on Facebook. Uh, I'm big into telepathy. People could you know, contact me anytime. I answer emails. Every email gets answered. So I, I'm open and uh, I love you guys. And thank you so much. Thank you. And, and you're one of uh, my, my Facebook feed. When, when I see your stuff, your faces, the back of the heads, um, you know, just just some of your series is, are, are really excellent, even when they're not hemp related. Um, so once again, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Um, it's, it's been great. I, I can't thank you enough. My pleasure, TJ. Thank you so much and uh, all the best to you and to your fellow Americans. I love you guys and I want to see you in Canada and I want to see you in the States and I want to, I want us all to do more great things in the, uh, in the world of our favorite vegetable, cannabis. Thank you. You can find more episodes of the Gondrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gondrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gondrepreneur.com website, you will find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gondrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, TG Brandfault.